That's a stack of documents, but Christina's amazing and she already printed them apparently, so they'll just be extras and things. I have that on a memory stick. Would that be helpful? Okay. I have a I have a presentation on the mountain stuff. Yeah. So when you lost it, Christina, I I lost my YouTube and then they both came back at the same time. Right. Oh, that's me. Okay. Oh. All right. Are we ready? I'm going to go ahead and start mine. Is, I'm ready, Christine, if you're ready. <laughs> Let me know. Christina, are you ready? I'm ready. As best I can. I know. Okay. Well, we need to go. All right. Welcome to the City of Klamath Falls work session. The time is 6.04. The date is Monday, October 18th, 2021. We will have a um, Klamath idea report from Kat Rutledge. And then at 6.30, we'll have a County Economic Development Association Casita report from Randy Cox. We'll start with Kat Rutledge, please. Thank you. Hello, Council. So good evening. I think all of you know me, Kat Rutledge, the director of the Klamath Idea. And I just uh, not come to ask you for money this time. I'm just coming to give you an update on what we've done with your investment over the last um, year. And um, I want to start um, out by just make sure everybody's on the same page about who we are, what we do, uh, what we're not. And then uh, we'll talk about um, what kind of some achievements that we've got for you. You all should have a couple of, couple of key pieces that might be helpful. One is an image of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And then the other one is our um, infographic of our achievements over the last year. And we do measure July 1st to June 30. So let's click, click, real look. No? Doesn't work. Doesn't it work for a minute? You want to click, Christina? <laughs> See if it will let you. No, it's okay. Technology is not our friend today. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> 
So you all have this presentation. Worst case scenario, we'll go low tech. Okay. So um, the first side slide, you can just leave it right there and I'll just move on. So this first slide really talks about what it is the Klamath idea is. And um, our job is really to, to, to connect, facilitate the linking of all of the elements of an entrepreneurial ecosystem, and then get entrepreneurs and connect them to that system. That's really what we're doing when we talk about entrepreneurial ecosystem. When I say that word, people go, okay, what the heck does that mean? So you have an image that should be helpful to you. And um, I want you to understand that all the players, actually there's a number of them in the room tonight. The city is even a player in this ecosystem. We as a community have chosen to put our entrepreneurs at the center of our ecosystem, right? They're at the center. And then there's all of these elements that surround them that they need in order to be successful. The city is clearly one of them. The SBDC also, which I run, is one of them. KFDA, Business Oregon. I know Randy's in the room somewhere, right? Casita. So there's a whole bunch of elements in that ecosystem that they need, and those people provide a direct service to those entrepreneurs. The Klamath idea is not a direct service provider. We are the linkages between all of that. We are the web, if you will, that connects them. The one place where we do do a little bit of a deep dive into the ecosystem is in celebratory culture because it's not a space where a lot of people hang out. So we fill that gap and support um, lots of things. Christina, you can go to the next slide if you will. Uh, support a number of things, including events. So events can be things like idea talks, where we put entrepreneurs up to tell their story, to inspire others, to connect with one another. We support things like Catalyze Klamath. The Klamath idea has been involved in Catalyze Klamath up at Oregon Tech for the seven years that it's, it's, it's existed, right? Supporting that, both financially and with human capacity. The uh, Badger Venture Program out at KCC. So we have helped KCC stand that program up, and that is the community college version of Catalyze. Right? So it's a pitch competition, which only unfortunately ran for two years before COVID hit. <laughs> so it doesn't have quite the history. We support the entrepreneurs that then come out of those programs and go represent our community at the state level in Invent Oregon. And these are all pitch competitions where our students are learning about business, they're pitching their concepts, and they're potentially winning ideas. Um, and they get money for it. So you should note, if you don't already know, that um, Catalyze Klamath has sent two teams that have won the entire Invent Orbit Oregon program two years in a row. So uh, we are, um, you're never a profit in your own land, but we are well known in the rest of the world. So that's super cool. So we do events. We tell stories, right? We create a celebratory culture. Next slide, please. And then this is the other really key thing that we do. We connect entrepreneurs to the right resources at the right time. So if you are an entrepreneur and we have, um, we have 19 nonprofit service providers in our community that help entrepreneurs. If you are an entrepreneur and you don't know where to go and there's alphabet soup, I would, I would say that most of our commu community members have no idea what the difference between the SBDC and KC is, right? They simply don't know. So they go to an organization inquiring about a service that they, that they need and they find out that, oh, that, that organization doesn't do it. So then they kick to another organization and they get kicked to another organization for a different need. There's a lot of confusion there and the reality is that we delay development because our entrepreneurs don't know where to go. So part of what the idea does is make sure that our entrepreneurs do know where to go. We do that in two ways. One is that we employ Justin Lair. He's in the audience here somewhere. Justin is our, and his title is purposeful. He's an entrepreneur concierge, right? Get to know them, figure out what they need, get them to the right resource at the right time. So he does that through outreach and visitation. We're gonna talk about that specific process here in a few minutes. The other way that we connect entrepreneurs is at the klamathidea.org. Christina, if you could pivot to that website. <laughs> so this website, um, it worked out quite well, actually that we were working on this project in COVID because it was something that we could do very easily remote and keep moving forward. So the Klamath Idea launched, klamathidea.org website launched in April, just after the pandemic began. And we originally started looking at this website, this company called SourceLink, 
because they had what was known as a resource navigator. And we loved the idea of having our entrepreneurs have 24 seven access to a navigator that could take them to the resource that they actually needed. It's okay, it's okay. So we, I'll just tell them, so we bought this software and um, originally for this navigator. Once we started to engage with the company, we learned that not only could they host our website and SourceLink, the company that does this, they only do entrepreneurial ecosystem building in the United States. That's all they do. So they could help us build our website. And then additionally, they have what's known as a CRM that sits under all of that, the website, the resource navigator. So we're capturing all of the data that comes out of our website. We're capturing all of the data that comes out of the resource navigator. And we have a customer relations management system that captures all of the interactions that we have with our entrepreneurs. All of our data is in one location. So we uh, got this launched. And in this navigator, which I'm going to show you, um, there are 19 nonprofit resource providers so far. We're not done. But the website itself has a great deal of um, curated content. So helping our businesses start up, grow, find funding. Those are kind of the three most common things that people are looking for. So in each, on each of those landing pages, and Christina, you don't have to click them, but in each of those landing pages, there's just a tremendous amount of resources for people that could self-help, really go look, read, find, all kinds of things from federal to state resources, articles, um, independent information. It's very, very helpful. So we've curated a whole bunch of content there. And then um, I'll have you do the navigator. So over on the right, you see the little gray widget. And this is kind of the mini widget. We're going to go to the big one here in a second. But let's say that um, if you go down to the box that says area of assistance, Christina, and it says do a drop down in the select box. And let's say that I would like to um, buy or sell a business. I'm gonna buy the Daily Bagel. And my specific need is I need, to, I need some help understanding the valuation of that business. So that person would pick valuation. And if you click search. So in our ecosystem so far, we have one organization the Small Business Development Center that will help someone figure out the valuation of a business. If you click on the KCC Small Business Development Center, Christina, it will take them, and this is true for all of our providers, it will take them to a page that provides further detail about that organization, who they are, what they do, all the things that they do, but most importantly to us, it also gives them the name, the phone number, and a web address, and an email address for that human. So what we did with our navigator and um, having worked now with SourceLink for a couple of years that many other communities did not do is we built a human network. As many of you know, we've been working on the Klamath idea for almost eight years now. And um, we built a human network and then we took a piece of technology and set it on top of it. And it's really been incredibly powerful in, all commun in our community. We've seen not such great success with communities who bought the technology and then tried to coalesce people around it. It's pretty interesting. So if we go um, up to the word resources, Christina, and then let's say that if you scroll down there a little bit, just at the general navigator, you're gonna see all the people that we have entered in here, who have entered themselves in here, are engaged partners. But if we go over and do another search, so if we in the, let's go to the um, area of assistance, and scroll way down at the bottom and say, I'm uh, starting my business. Whoop. <laughs> starting a business. And let's, uh, in uh, specific need, I need some site selection. I need to figure out where I'm going to put my business before I can go my, buy my city business license. And if you, you can pick all of these other fields if you choose to. Many people don't. And if you with filter resources, it'll take those 19 resources and again, filter them. And lo and behold, the three partners that are sitting in the room show up. So Business Oregon helps people with site location. Choose Klamath, Casita helps people with site location, as does KFDA. So we've just quickly narrowed that list to three people. And um, 
based upon their specialities, you see that both CASIDA and KFDA have marked in their profiles that they specialize in that, right? So um, somebody could click on that, get a contact, and make a call, right? So that's a really powerful tool that we wanted to make sure you know is out there for your um, entrepreneurs. So Ms. Christina, if you'll go back. To the slides. So those are two ways, really, right? Interpersonally through Justin and through the website, 24-7, people can connect to the right resources at the right time. So when we talk about, this was a couple of years ago when I came and presented to you, we were working on um, a measurement system. How would we know that this um, thing we're doing is going to help the community? How are we going to measure it? So we developed a master scorecard, and we have really three sections to that scorecard. Entrepreneurship, as you've probably heard me say before, is a long-term game. It is not go catch the big fish and get 50 jobs. <laughs> it is a long-term game. It's going to take us some time. So in ecosystem building, one of the important metrics is foundational capacity, right? You build the foundation, you build the infrastructure. The next layer of, me of measurement is really economic impacts, and that is what most elected officials are accustomed to looking at. The third layer of economic impact is really transformational impact. And we're going to talk about all three of those layers with some actual data from our project. So foundational capacity, you'll see that um, the Klamath idea in 2019, we were operating on about $35,000. And by 2021, we had garnered enough attention and support from a variety of sources to come up with $120,000. That made the difference for us to be able to hire a full-time concierge. So Justin's position came into play in July of last summer. So you'll see, and you'll see, obviously, staff correlates directly to that capacity. Point four in 2019, that was me. I work about six to eight hours on this project. And then we have a program assistant that helps with communication. The next year, I lost my program assistant. She went and got married. And we had a hard time replacing her. So we were down to just me. And then you'll see in 21 that we picked up Justin, myself, and replace the program assistant. So we're kind of at full capacity now, which is super exciting. Next. So I talked to you um, already about the, the launch of the website. That was a major strategic accomplishment for us. From that website, you'll note that we have, I've said it before, 19 e-resource partners engaged in that site. We've had 1,400 visits to that website. We've had 995 soft referrals to partners. Now, a soft referral is just what I showed you. You go to the website, you click on Business Org, and you get Larry's name and email, right? That's a soft referral. I don't know whether that person ever called Larry or what, right? That's a soft referral, but we know that they looked at that profile. Then we also have qualified referrals, and we're going to talk about the visitation process. So the website is really available to to anyone, obviously, on the internet that would be concerned about finding resources in our region. But our entrepreneur outreach and visitation process is still very targeted. You might remember a couple of years ago that we um, intentionally chose, through economic data, we intentionally chose magnet experiential tourism entrepreneurs to focus on because we feel that that's an economic opportunity for our community. So we are still focused on those individuals and we're focused on the allied businesses around them. So hospitality, restaurants, other amenities that our tourists need to find while they're here. So we are still doing outreach and targeted efforts toward the, that particular community. And as we come out of the pandemic, obviously we feel like that was a good move because <laughs> they need a lot of support right now. So Justin, right, is responsible for our entrepreneur engagement process. And in that last year, uh, he had 504 entrepreneur interactions, which means he's emailed, had a cup of coffee with, spoke with, communicated in some fashion, phone call. Then we've got 15 entrepreneur visitations. So what happens is, Justin, we have a leads list of all the people in that sector, or we, uh, we do things like we monitor the city business license. If somebody in that sector pops up, Justin's on it, right? So we do outreach to those, to those people, and then if they want to engage with us, right, he will send them a survey, and the survey is typically, um, it's about seven pages, so it's kind of a commitment on their, on their behalf. They're telling us everything from, were my parents entrepreneurs? How much of the business do I own? Um, how much time do I spend on the business? They answer questions about kind of their outlook 
in the business community, and it provides us with a whole bunch of information to really assess whether this is a growth-oriented entrepreneur, super important to us, and um, whether they want help and whether we have a way to help them in our ecosystem. So we look at that assessment, and if we gain that, yeah, they're a growth-minded person and they really want help and we think we can help them, Justin will arrange a visitation. And that visitation is Justin, our entrepreneur concierge, and a member of the leadership team, which is um, KFDA, the chamber, myself, SCOED. Um, and then we have three entrepreneurs that serve on that, on that team as well. We go out and we visit with that entrepreneur for a couple of hours, getting to know them, hearing their story. How did they start? Why did they start? How are things going? What keeps you awake at night? So they do that visitation, and then they come back, and we decide which resources would be most helpful to them at that point in time. So they're not being pinged around, right? If you need to get capital, you need to have a business plan first. So there's no reason to go talk to a bank or SCOED or Craftery, right? Let's get you into the SBDC, get a business plan built. So Justin will begin to make qualified referrals based upon that person's needs. And that's what those 27 referrals are that you see there. So he visited with them, identified exactly what they need, made a referral, and then there's a connection process there. So we visited with 15 of them, um, and we have secured collaboration statements from 14 of those that he visited with. A collaboration statement, this is a very conscious partnership. The, the whole idea concept is very conscious partnership. We disclose what we're going to do for them. They disclose what we expect of them. We help them understand what we expect of them. And it begins a relationship, right, to, to support that person and get them along the development process as quickly as possible. Next. So the other really exciting thing, I know you may not think it's exciting, I think it's super exciting because I've sunk a lot of energy into this thing for a long time. We uh, really have some super good um, progress on economic impacts. We really didn't think we would get to economic impact until about 10 years. We're eight years in, we're starting to pull some impacts, which is exciting. So one of the things that um, is super interesting about the last year is we had a tremendous amount of startup activity in COVID, which really surprised me, right? Um, if you, and we pulled data from a number of different places to keep a pulse on it. But one of the things we do is monitor the smart startup attendance. So at the SBDC, we run a startup class every 10 to 12 days. And in 2019, you'll see we had run 76 people through that class. Pandemic hits in 2020, even though we did not run that class for almost four and a half months, we still had 58 people come through that class. And in 2021, we already had 58 people as the, the close of the data. So we're still seeing a lot of startup activity, which is super interesting to me. We also pulled data from the Oregon Secretary of State about new business registrations. And you'll see in 2019, 2020, they were about the same. Um, just under 700. Well, look at that spike in 2021. And we know that at least 100 of those are people who had to go get themselves registered with the Secretary of State because they had failed to do so and they wanted some of Oregon's money. So they went and got themselves registered. But even if we knock 100 off of that, that's still a tremendous amount of startup activity in our county. And then the next uh, measure that we're using is uh, just new businesses in downtown. We opened 42 new businesses in downtown Klamath Falls between July 1st and June 30. Pretty interesting. Um, and then, of course, the good old economic impact. All of this data is aggregated. We have 28 entrepreneurs that are engaged with us. And all of those entrepreneurs collectively across the course of that year increased their sales by 145,000, invested 52 grand into their business, created 13 jobs, and we collectively supported 123 jobs in those 28 businesses. Mm -hmm. Next. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me make this tangible for you. <laughs> Here's a story um, of one of the entrepreneurs that um, we, Justin really, has been working with. So Crater Air um, had been working on founding their business for, it was about probably 18 months or so, two years, and Justin got wind of them did some outreach, um, sat down with the, the four of these entrepreneurs and visited. These guys are attempting to, um, they've already actually launched it, but they are founding a business to provide photographic aerial tours over Crater Lake, right? So what a fun, right, tourism economy piece. But they were having a tremendous amount of trouble with the government, not surprising, right? So 
Larry, I think it was Larry and Justin did this, Larry Holzgang and Justin did this uh, visitation and uh, found out the struggles they were having. And so they, they, of course, they were very eager, coachable. We signed a collaboration statement. Justin not only made a referral to the SBDC to help them kind of firm up some business plans and see if there's anywhere they could pivot in the meantime while we overcame some of this red tape. And then, of course, a um, referral to Larry Holzgang because Larry has connections directly to the state of Oregon. So um, Larry began to work with them and um, an advisor at the SBDC. And we um, just actually before we closed the economic impact season, they had flown their first trip. <laughs> so um, making some progress. And these guys, um, it's really risky for me to stand up in front of city council and tell you about a startup, right? Because they may not make it, <laughs> right? But I chose these guys because they've made a considerable investment. They have purchased two airplanes to make this happen. So um, they're ambitious and they are, um, I think, a group that we will absolutely see succeed. So that's a cool story. Next slide. Um, another um, cool story that I cannot uh, pass up. Some of you have probably heard this story, but Part of what I told you is the, the Klamath idea is it's not just me. It's a huge partnership of people working really hard to get out of our silos, to work for the better, betterment of the community, to make referrals across lines, um, and to really get as many fingerprints on an entrepreneur as we can, whoever they need. And we've done that and built trust with one another. We come into COVID, right? And I'm sure you all remember the first at least four months of COVID was absolute mayhem. Right? Nobody knew what was happening. Programs were changing literally overnight. There was just mass confusion and chaos. The partners of the idea um, convened every Friday for the first several months of that. And we shared resources. We told each other where, <laughs> where things were, what we had learned, where we shared. And um, because of that intense collaboration, our community got a hundred and our business community got a hundred and two million dollars in CARES funding on the ground. That is a tremendous amount of money into our small businesses and it is really truly one of the reasons that they say at the state levels about our region we received a glancing blow from this thing, right? Um, but it was a collaborative effort. Everyone turned around and reached out into their networks and did everything they could. Our bankers were amazing and um, really helped our people. It paid off to be rural, and it paid off to have a partnership where we were already collaborating. Super, super powerful. And I think I have one more slide. Okay, so I talked about foundational indicators. Those are all moving nicely. We're getting some economic impact, which is exciting. And now we're looking in the next couple of years for some really good transformative indicators, like transforming our community. We have a number of things that we're looking at, but I just wanted to give you two little glimmers of hope. <laughs> so one of them is we need to increase our population, right? Particularly in the uh, generational bands, my generation and the next one under, right? We need workforce, we need workers. And um, we saw in this period of time a 237 person annualized increase in our population. I know that sounds really small, but um, most rural communities are continuing to see a decline in population. So that's a super important trend for us. And 157 of those were from net migration, which means people coming to the community. The rest of those are birth over death kind of data, right? So some people moving. The other important transformative indicator is that um, we are, of course, targeting the increase and expansion of our county tax base. And so you'll see we saw a pretty considerable jump there. So that's also proof, right, that everything that your economic development people are doing is, is starting to make a difference. So entrepreneurial talent is universal across the earth, but environments for growing them are not. So thank you so much for your partnership. Um, in this kind of unorthodox kind of economic development. And um, I'm excited. I think it's working. There's a really great energy in our community. And I think it will continue. What questions can I answer for you? Any questions? Well, you're doing a fabulous job. Thank you so much for your presentation. Any questions and parting? Alrighty. Well, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. all you're doing.
Okay. At this point, we will now have um, Randy Cox, um, Klamath County Economic Development Association. I almost felt like I should put a bring a computer screen up here and talk through the computer screen because I'm so used to Zoom meetings. It's sort of <laughs> nice to be here in person. In fact, I don't believe it, but hey, we're here in person. Yeah. Hey, I'd like to give you guys a quick update um, in regards to what's going on with Casita. I want to make sure that I have opportunities for questions as I go through my side deck. If you do have questions, don't hesitate to stop me and we'll go over the questions to answer but we'll start out with a small video here and then we'll go over the presentation It's a really good video. We've got, we've got some great people in it. And <laughs> I'm sure it's really good. Uh, no? No, it's not you, it's me. I know. Well, let me tell you what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. It was really good. I'm glad that cat went first because I thought that all the gremlins would be there. Get this panic button. And Mayor Westfall is going to hit the three minute warning. I was going to start. No. Oh, no. We'll get through this. We'll get through this. No. Yeah. 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 No. Are you playing it directly from a slapstick or from the jump stick? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it showing there? Playing on your computer? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if you guys want to come around. <laughs> Seriously. Do you have duplicate, okay, duplicate okay. screen? Or extend it? Well, Mike, you can tell them what you're seeing there. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> can you narrate it? Oh, there we are. Is there a volume? <laughs> sure, it's turned all the way up. No, this is where Randy steps in and narrates. Okay. Okay. That <laughs> <laughs> Make it happen. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is really enjoyable. How many people have seen the video? It is on our website and our Facebook as well. It's a great video. I'm so sorry. I was hoping to drop the mic as soon as the video was over, but okay, we'll go ahead. Go on, go to the next slide. That's, that's fine. If you haven't seen the video, let me know. I'll make sure you get it. It's our first um, sort of step in branding and branding Klamath. Um, got a couple people, at least one person in here that we can get an autograph if you want to. It shows very well on this video. Randy, that's just on your website? Yes. Okay. 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 
All right. Go to slide three. That was really good, though. <laughs> All right. Still got a lot of economic momentum going on. Um, I've got three slides just to show you sort of a snapshot of what's going on in Klamath County right at the moment. This slide alone is about $980 million. Really cornerstone by the Swan Lake Energy Storage Project that will be picking their general contractors at the beginning of 2022 and be breaking ground towards the end of 2022, early 2023. Big project, 400 plus employees will be here during the build for five years. Um, both contractors that are bidding on that job have been in town. They've, they've spent numerous nights in town and they're getting their quotes ready for the final evaluation. Y'all know, we talked, I think, last time about Neiman. We're working with Neiman quite a bit. I'll talk about them a little bit more about what we're doing for them up in um, North County. Vocational or apprenticeship program, Loves, you're seeing that come up. Oregon Tech should be open next year. And then, obviously, Cornerstone by Wilson Art. But about $980 million, $980 million on that side. Next. This is sort of an exciting side. We'll, we'll be talking about this one in a little bit more detail. Um, a major expansion at JMP Wholesale. We'll talk about that one in four blocker and go through it. And also the Klamath Revitalization Fund. Um, the Bogotay's headquarters is up and going. A nice project for Tech Hills. Um, Foothills RFP has been awarded, and we had a meeting actually this afternoon to talk about that one. But that's sort of the vision of what that will look like up on Foothills across the street from Steen Sports Park. Working on a major project at Klamath Works right now, and hopefully we'll get that one closed, but we're working towards um, um, adding a, a second additional new building into that operation. And then hopefully you saw the announcement at Linden Trucking that moved to South 97, added 50. They're in the process of adding 50 new drivers to that location, expanding their, their presence here in Klamath Falls. About $75 million represented on that slide. And um, we haven't forgot about downtown. It's still about setting the table in your downtown and making sure that you're moving in the right direction. Um, a lot of neat things going on. Still a lot of talks on a project in Timbermill Shores. We're hoping that we'll be able to share that, more information on that as it goes forward. Um, but a lot of investment in downtown, representing about $62 million worth of investment in downtown that are either on their way or are completed and added to the community. So a total of about $1.1 billion of spend is, is queued up for Klamath County in the next 12 months. Um, none of these are speculative projects. They're all go projects. It's just about timing. Our profile, next. I thought the video was going to start playing. I, I got really excited there. Uh, we have 45 projects on our deck right now. About 966 employees, $2.2 billion worth of projects. Majority of those are in recruitment and attraction, or about 53% are in that category. 27%, um, 28% are in retention and expansion, then scalable entrepreneurship. We have eight projects in that category. Moving in the right direction, they're spread quite nicely across the four clusters, the five clusters that we focus on. And those, are, those bottom pie charts are the ones are the clusters representing the clusters. Next. Most important slide, you can hit it twice there um, if you want to. Most important slide is really one more time. You can actually hit it one more and one more. Again? Yep. God, oh, look at that animation. <laughs> Probably the most important slide on the deck is I could come to you and say, hey, I got 43 projects. They're all in ideation. They're just ideas. Maybe they'll happen. You want to know what projects are moving forward. And our key projects are either in stage three or stage four. Those are the ones that are closest to breaking ground and or commu commercialization. Today, we're sitting on 13 projects in ideation, which is important to us because we want to make sure the pipeline stays full. So we are, we're sitting on 13 there, 11 in Tollgate 1, which is scope and feasibility, sitting on 9 in Tollgate 2, which is design and concept or development and design. Seven of our projects are permitting and funding, and three, in our pro three of our projects are in groundbreaking and or commercialization. We've closed 14 projects over the last two years, the first two years of our three-year strategy, 
the 14 projects that we closed created 300 jobs and $109 million worth of investment into our community. They're spread fairly nicely. Always would like to see high tech be a little bit higher. Um, there's some challenges in that area, but we do have four nice high tech projects on our deck. But that's our spread across the five clusters that we look at. The first project I want to talk to you about is one that we're really excited about. Um, very innovative way to develop housing. Housing availability and attainability within Klamath Falls is key. It is limiting us from being able to expand existing businesses and or recruit new businesses to our community. So in May of 2019, we set out to raise funds to build specula speculative houses to ensure that we have enough housing stock to draw and expand businesses. We had all the money raised by December 2019, and unfortunately something happened in February of 2020 that made us step back and relook at it. We retooled in the end of the mid-year of February, or excuse me, 2020, recapitalized. We raised $5 million to build houses. That is with um, 11 individuals within our community that wanted to get back to housing um, within our community. And we, if you hit the next slide, we broke ground two weeks ago on our first house, and we will be breaking ground on the next four houses within the next three weeks. Um, we have 12 lots that we have acquired. We're working with six different builders right at the moment to build spec, spec homes and trying to create an atmosphere that we can accelerate housing within our community, supplement our 45-year-old housing stock, and train, mentor, and develop the construction trades within our, within our community. We're going to talk about a couple projects. If you go back one real quick, um, Project Locomotive, when it's yellow in the bottom of the timeline, that means it was just about ready to be closed or taken off the project deck list. There was not enough activity to move it forward. And this is one you never give up on a project. We thought, oh, we'd love to do this, but it will never work. And just no information over the last year or six months until this year. Um, this is really expanding a capacity planning, uh, expanding project for um, Klamath Falls JMP Wholesale, moving their, their yard from nine cars capability or capacity to 55 cars of capacity. You'll see on the next slide sort of what the project is. Um, removing 500 feet of track, adding 2,000 feet of track um, for project, what we call project fluid, adding 600 feet of new track, to feed into JMP Wholesale and putting three switches in. In collaboration with um, Business Oregon and Larry Hull's game, we were able to hit the next slide. We were able to do receive the first ever Governor's Strategic Reserve Fund um, commitment to Klamath Falls at a range of $250,000 that will go towards this project. When she was here a year and a half ago and I met with her, we brought this project up. We've been working on this project for I think before I started with Casita, people were working on this project, but we finally actually got it approved by the governor. She'll help fund this project as a capacity expanding project. Next. I throw Project Fluid in there because that's the 2,000 foot of track that you saw in the last thing. That is actually a very interesting project that will be removing 200 trucks a month from Highway 97 and Highway 58 in expansion of the bringing product into JMP Wholesale. Um, on that 2,000 feet of track. I was out there a couple weeks ago and there were about 15 cars on that track, so it's already been functioning and operating on the, on the 2,000 feet. The next one is an exciting project. We talked about it a little bit to start out with, and this is the RFP that we put out, and you can change it to the next slide. Um, the RFP we put out for the 40 acres across the street from Steen Sports Park. Um, there were two submissions for this RFP to the county for that 40 acres. Um, um, RMC or Rocky Mountain actually won the submissions on this, and these are some of the renderings of looking at expanding that operation or developing that operation across from Steen Sports Park. Hopefully we'll be able to get the tunnel in under Foothills and actually have them have access to Steen Sports, Sports Park as a development. Exciting times. We had a great meeting on it today, and we'll continue to see more and more meetings, but there'll be about 100 to 120 houses and general commercial on this site. 
um, both single family, multifamily, and potentially even apartments on this particular location. Never give up on a project. This is another one that was yellow. We've worked on this one for a couple of years, and thank, thank, I'd like to thank the, the counselors for approving um, uh, pro this project up on Tech Health. It was approved, I think, a year and a half to two years ago. The initial person that brought it to the council backed out of the project overall. Um, we just were able to recruit someone new into this project, and they closed on the project last Wednesday and they'll be developing a 130-slot RV park up on Tech Hills um, in the very near future. And that's all I have. But I'm very open for questions, if you have any questions. Well, you've done a fabulous job. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's been wonderful. I appreciate it. Your guys' support is is incredible and we appreciate it and there's a lot of things going on there's two projects i wish i could talk about tonight but it's just they're just too in their infancy level but they're major projects that'll make a major difference to climate falls mm -hmm. that are right now in due diligence that mm -hmm. will change the dynamics of climate falls so i appreciate it. you can always reach me if you have any other questions thanks so much for your support excellent and very good uh huh. Okay, that concludes our work session for this evening, and we'll be having a meeting at 7. Thank you.
I think I think we'll just leave it like that. You know it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you look like that.
Good evening, citizens and staff. I'm Mayor Carol Westfall, here, hereby call to order this council meeting on October 18th, 2021. It is 7 p.m. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Tunkel? Here. Councilor Dotson? Here. Councilor Steinberg? Here. Councilor Blaine? Here. Councilor Andres is absent. Uh, move to excuse. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, we have some presentations this evening. Um, Elise, the City of Klamath Falls has a certificate of service to award to Elise Keown. Um, Finance and Business Service Department, Utility Billing Division for the completion of 10 years of service on October 3rd, 2021. I'd like to come on up. And the City of Klamath Falls has a Certificate of Service to award Christina Mainwaring, City of Administration, for the completion of 15 years of service on October 13th, 2021. And I believe Jessica is online, would like to say a few words. Our City Manager. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Hi. Hi, Christina, I just want to say thank you for everything you do. I know you wear different hats and get bounced all over the place with different projects and I just wanted to say thank you for all that you do. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And so we have we're going to open out for public comment at this time. So we have some people that have signed up. And you can come up to the podium as I call your name. Um, we'll start with Kate Murphy. And you'll have three minutes, and we've got your information. You can state your name, though. My name is Kate Murphy, and I'm here representing the Klamath Falls Friends Church, the Quaker Church. And I'd like to read a letter that we sent to the City Council. The Klamath Falls Friends Church is writing to encourage the City of Klamath Falls to honor the recommendations of its appointed equity task force and immediately begin moving forward with the implementation of these recommendations. A clear first step is the renaming of Kit Carson Park. We, like many in the community, were surprised and disappointed by how quickly the city disbanded the equity task force. To maintain the hope and goodwill won by in our community, by the appointment of the task force, we urge the city not to fail in following through on their recommendations. Specifically, we, we believe the most pressing and indisputable necessary first step is renaming of Kit Carson Park. Not only is Klamath Falls situated on Klamath and Modoc lands, but these indigenous peoples called this area home long before the first white settlers came to this continent. Kit Carson, for whom the park is currently named, is a problematically, mythologically historical figure. His fictitious feats were publicized in dime store novels, consumed by Easterners, exam, um, enamored by false ideas of Western frontier, westward expansion, and the need to rid their lands of the indigenous so-called savages who already had their homes there. It makes no sense in the light of history and community diversity to continue to support a park named after a man who massacred a Klamath village and is responsible for the murder of many Native Americans in this area. The city of Klamath Falls can not only address this wrong, but also reinvigorate public faith in our diverse community 
welcoming of all its members by renaming the park. Perhaps it would be do, we would do well to ask the Klamath tribes to recommend a name that they think would honor the original peoples of this area. As Quakers, we value equality, integrity, and community as essential to our spiritual life. We encourage the council to diligently study and move forward on the recommendations of the equity task force and begin a time of greater equity, integrity, and community here in Klamath Falls by renaming Kit Carson Park. Respectfully submitted by the members of the Klamath Falls Friends Church. Thank you. And, and city attorney. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm sorry to break in during this um, pre public comment time, but I think it is important to let people know. The Council did, as you directed at the last meeting, this issue has been sent to the Parks Advisory Board. Staff did meet with them last week, and they are beginning this process for the renaming to examine the different things. Thank you. And we have Wendy Williams. Well, thank you for these moments to speak with you. Uh, yes, my name is Wendy Williams, and I am a member of the Quaker Friends Church in town, and uh, I, too, underscore what Kate read to you. Uh, I feel ashamed driving into town and seeing that name up there, and I'm grateful that we're moving forward. I guess I don't have to say what I said since we're moving forward, but... Um, you know, it would just make, be such a peaceful gesture to the Klamath tribes and to the children of our city, especially who see it when they play there. <laughs> and um, I'm grateful to Klamath Falls for moving forward on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Griffin Toffler. Hello, my name is Griffin Toffler, and I'm a member of the Friends Church, Klamath Falls. And I support the letter that we sent, that we read. And it, I, I also am very ashamed every time I drive by. I drive by frequently, so I appreciate this being expedited in a way that this can be taken care of quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Lucas. Hello. Hello. Uh, I always hate doing these things. Anyway, I just, I, I want to say definitely I agree with the renaming. That was fabulous stuff, so yay. But I do believe we need to, that letter that the Equity Task Force received saying that this was not going to continue. I don't think that's the right step. I think that was part of the thing of saying that we made that resolution and you guys agreeing to pass it meant it was going to continue, not ending the way it seemed to be. Um, and then the only other thing I really have to say is with like that RV park, wouldn't it be nice to find something for our, you know, our low income housing needs that are needed here because the rent continues to increase so much. And, just causes further inequity with everything. So that's all I got to say. Right, and I just I just wanted to, to just let you know that um, we do have a process, and so we, we have a uh, parks committee, mm -hmm. and then we refer to them. So it's all part of a process that we do need to follow, but it's, it's really important that everybody is involved, and I think it's going to be a lot bigger than than one little group. It's it's going to oh, be the whole community. Absolutely, I agree with that completely. But there are a lot of recommendations there that the equity task force made that aren't necessarily to do with just the renaming of the park. So I just want to make sure that all of that is continued as well. So. Right. What one one step at a time. We're we're yes. moving on it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Joey Gentry. begin speaking speaking and the shot clock's already ticking uh, down. I, I just said it okay just reset it thank you joey gentry and um 
great news about Kit Carson that completely changed the trajectory of what I was going to say to mm -hmm. you today. Um, but I'm here to ask you that you, we, we resume the equity work that we started together with the equity task force and the passing of the equity resolution that promised the city would adopt equity in, as a guiding principle in all of our decision-making processes. Uh, the resolution committed the City Council to the deep and continual work of creating an inclusive community today and for future generations. And the City promised in that equity resolution to continually seek opportunities to restore, expand, and expand equity in collaboration with the Equity Task Force, Standing Equity Committee, and the broader community. I'm not a lawyer or an expert in government um, operations and procedures. Um, but it would seem to me that the abrupt and unilateral disbanding of the equity task force without any formal debriefing or conversation and no observable plan for the future permanent standing equity committee, um, which was actually cemented in that equity resolution, it presents us with some potential problems, potential legal problems. At the very least, those actions were a betrayal. Um, they were broken promises. They were not collaborative in nature, and they caused harm to our community. Um, you're addressing Kit Carson Park. I would just caution you to put it in the hands solely of the Parks Department, because equity work is not amplifying the voices of um, people who already continually have their voices amplified. It's not continuing, continuing to hear from white people in positions of power, but rather it is listening to and amplifying the voices of black indigenous people of color. It's hearing our voices. It's saying that this is, park is named after um, a genocidal murderer who committed, who, who's responsible for the deaths of countless indigenous people. It's hearing an indigenous person say that and taking that authority to make that change without a community vote and buy-in. Because when given the opportunity, a lot of people will continue to maintain those systems of white, of white supremacy. And that's why you um, formed the equity task force. Mm -hmm. So I think in your, um, you ghosted our, our task force. Um, that we, we laid the groundwork and the foundation for us to maintain continuity and forward moving traction. And that communication, when we attempted to keep the door propped open, it was shut on us. Mm. And I think it is important. Um, it was a betrayal and a, a disillusioned in the process. Mm. Any questions? I would just encourage people to. The, the the Park Advisory Board does have public meetings, so if you are engaged and you want to be part of that voice, I encourage you to attend those meetings to start. There is a second Thursday of every month at 11.30 here, I think, from what mm -hmm. I could tell from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And do we have uh, Courtney Newbaum in, on the... Uh... She is not, but you have seven other members of the community. I'm not necessarily sure because they're all muted, obviously, <coughs> um, as to what potential items are on Zoom for, but you have seven different members, not Courtney. Oh. Can anyone you ask if they just start, what they want to speak under public comment? And, then we'll and that they would start. have three minutes. Mm -hmm. So let's start with um, Jeff McCormick. Are you possibly on the Zoom to speak under public comment? He's wastewater. That's Jeff McCormick. Okay. Um, wastewater. Kay Miller. And He's airport. I think they're all on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there, there is nobody else. Um, anybody else wishing to speak um, during this time? Public comment on anything that is not on the agenda. Okay. Seeing and hearing nobody else, we're going to close public comment at this point. Um, and we will go into consent agenda. The approval of the consent agenda, meeting agenda, and items 5.2 and 5.3. 5.2 is the September 2021 project update for the wastewater treatment plant upgrade. And 5.3 is the public acceptance of Russet Drive infrastructure and roadway improvements. 
Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Number six, land use public hearing, quasi-judicial. Um, shall I read the script first? Okay. 6.1, a special ordinance rezoning approximately 0 0.43, 43 acres of land legally described as lot 17 through 21 and the eastern portion of lot 22 of block 8 of the industrial additional subdivision from light industrial and public facility to medium density residential. And first reading, um, I would like to, anybody wants to declare a um, conflict of, in, of interest from the council. Okay, audience, does any member of the audience wish to challenge the participation of any member of council? I don't see anybody. City Attorney, please read the uh, process and procedures. Thank you, Mayor. The City of Klamath Falls is obligated to follow its comprehensive plan, its community development ordinance, and state statutes when it reviews requests for development. Tonight, the City Council will consider the applicant's request to rezone approximately 0.43 acres of land from light industrial to public facility to medium, de excuse me, light industrial light industrial and public facility to medium density residential in light of the standards and criteria which are identified by staff in this report. Participants in this hearing must direct their testimony towards the applicable substantive criteria which staff has identified. If anyone feels other criteria in the plan or code, uh, code apply to this decision, they must identify that criteria clearly so that city council and the parties have an opportunity to respond. If a participant fails to raise an issue with sufficient specificity and fails to support the issue with evidence, the opportunity for an appeal to Luba on that issue and in issue and in action for damages in circuit court will be waived. I suggest that any person speaking tonight address remarks to whether the applicant meets the criteria and if not state why not. After the staff report, the applicant may make his or her presentation first. Proponents will follow the applicant. Then opponents and those who wish to speak from a neutral position will have an opportunity. Rebuttal will be available only to the applicant. Once the hearing is complete, the city council has the following options. Adopt and approve the findings. Amend the findings and adopt and approve them as amended. Deny the findings. Continue the hearing to a future date to allow further consideration and evidence. City Council finds that all of the approve, approval criteria have been met and the applicant has proven that the application fully complies with the applicable comprehensive plan policies and, other, and any provisions of the code and other city implementing ordinances. It must approve the application. If even one of the approval criteria have not been met, the City Council must deny the application unless, in the discretion of the Council, a condition of approval can be fashioned to address that criterion. Please note that if a participant requests and is granted a continuous to supplement the record before the conclusion of the hearing, the record shall remain open for at least seven days after the hearing. If the record remains open, such an extension shall not be subject to the 120-day limit. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Can we have Planning Manager Joe Wall review the report, please? All right. That was a long lead-up probably to what we'll be presenting this evening. Uh, may not be the most controversial or we'll say interesting land use public hearing. Uh, what we're looking at here, it's a collection of five to six lots within the Mills edition, fairly small undersized lots individually. Uh, they are currently zoned light industrial, kind of just east of the railroad tracks, and then one of the lots is zoned public facility. It abuts city-owned land, which I believe was formerly uh, Little League ball fields. Um, I don't know if there are any particular questions on this before I kind of get going, but the gist of it is the property owners of these lots desire to construct residences, uh, probably three total single-family residences, which are not allowed within the current zoning mix. Cannot do residential within light industrial or public facility zoning. Uh, typically, I wouldn't recommend converting industrial zone employment lands, let's say, over to residential zoning, but in this instance, you look at the lot sizes, where they are. Um, I don't imagine this being an area developed with heavy industry or the like. So there are a series of criteria that we have both within the comprehensive plan and then the community development ordinance. Uh, staff included all of those criteria and the responses to within the draft zone change ordinance. If we would like to go over any particular criteria, do let me know. 
Uh, a lot of it has to do with the site is particularly suited for the proposed use. There wouldn't be a lack of services, utilities, transportation, other items of the nature, um, kind of contiguity requirements and the like. I will note, and I was actually a little bit surprised, but we received a letter from the Fair Housing Council of Oregon after the Planning Commission meeting, which I included in the packet. Um, the only reason I say that is because here we are encouraging or changing to a residential zone, and it was like, you need additional findings for So I'm like, okay. Um, we completed the housing needs analysis a few years ago, and it noted, I'll just say, a lat or a surplus of residential land in every single zoning category. So it's kind of hard to necessarily come up with a justification for increased residential zoning. But in the scheme of this 0 0.43 acres, I really didn't find anything too substantive one way or another in the grand scheme. So I don't believe the applicants are here this evening. They were at the planning commission meeting. Um, after the zone change, if it is approved, they would submit a residential review application to our department where we look at all the standards that we do on a typical residence. You have enough parking, it's setback, lot coverage, et cetera. So with that, um, I guess any questions for staff or was, open up public Was planning hearing? commission um, involved in this, looking at they, this as They well? were. So planning commission meeting uh, was last month, uh, and they had a unanimous decision to recommend approval of the zone change to city council at their meeting. Excellent. Oh, excellent. So. Um, OK. Uh, just just very quick note, uh, Planning Commission staff presented findings with Planning Commission recommended for approval without modification. Since that time, there has been a slight modification to the findings. Uh, the findings, all I did was include specific reference to this city council meeting, the fact that we sent out additional notice, put it in the newspaper, and then I also added reference to the additional what they call Goal 10 housing findings within the public need <coughs> criteria and that is in response to the letter that we had received. All other items are the same as recommended by Planning Commission. Any questions? I'd like to open this, um, to op open the hearing to the public. Is there anybody wishing to speak on this? Anybody online? Okay, seeing and hearing nobody, I will close that. Okay, so applicants not present. Okay, very good. So discussion with council, staff, questions? Or just a motion? Is that what you need? Yeah. It's listed in there. Yeah, it's listed in there. Okay, That's I would. I would move to accept the proposed findings as presented by staff and recommended by the planning commission with the minor modification. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Okay. Thank you very much. Do we need no, to do? No, no, do we need to? Yeah. Okay. Two more. We need two yeah. more. <laughs> move to approve the requested zone change from light industrial public. Facility to medium density residential based on the accepted findings. Second. Roll call, please. No, not on this one. Not on this one. Motion. Motion. All in, approved. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. And I would move to introduce the ordinance for first reading by title only. Second. Roll call. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Are you going to read I, it or do you want Mike to? I can do it. I can, I can go ahead and read if you okay. can hear me. Okay, yes, we can hear you. A special ordinance rezoning approximately 0.43 acres of land legally described as lots 17, 17 through 21 in the eastern portion of lot 22 of block 8 of the industrial addition subdivision from light industrial and public facility to medium density residential. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are we done? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, 7.1, authorization to accept a transportation growth management TGM grant 
to update and the Urban Area Transportation <coughs> System Plan, TSP. Public Works Director, Mark Wilbert. Thank reporting. you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I think the title kind of pretty much said it all, but uh, back in March we came before you asking for your authorization to submit a grant application for uh, transportation, transportation Growth Management Funds to update our Transportation System Plan, or TSP. We were recently notified that we did receive that grant, <coughs> and so we're asking for your authorization to accept that grant. Uh, the grant amount is $250,000 with matching funds uh, split between the city and county of about $30,000 for a total project budget of about $280,000. Um, next step will be to put together a scope of work. I'll do that jointly with, uh, with ODOT, and then we will look at going out and getting a consultant. The next time, assuming you authorize us to accept the grant, we'll be back before you. We'll be with an intergovernmental agreement or an IGA with ODOT for the scope of the project and the funds. So with that, I'll answer any questions you might have. Questions? I have just one quick question. Uh-huh, go ahead. It, I don't remember, can you remind me, was that um, the match, is that something we budgeted for or that we need to? We did budget for it, yes. Okay. Thank you. So I'll move to authorize the Public Works Director to accept the TGM grant and process accordingly. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, right. thank, thank you. you. 7.2, construction service contract with Bob's Excavating Incorporated for the Canby and East Street water main replacement project in the not to exceed amount of 531831 and we have Development Service Director Scott Satters reviewing. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, another one of our two-inch and four-inch um, undersized water main replacement projects. Uh, the project was originally slated for Canby and East Streets only. Uh, however, through the design process um, and working with, with our, our water division, we decided to expand this particular project to include Canby Street, East Street, Upham Street, 12th Street, and Lincoln Street. So the total project is roughly 1,750 feet of water line replacement with new eight inch pipe. Uh, the sole uh, limit water losses, improve maintenance, co maintenance costs, improve water uh, distribution and provide fire protection in an area that doesn't isn't not currently uh, served. Um, the project was bid on August 26th with only one bid received from Bob's Excavating in the price of $531,831. Total design and construction costs including a 15% contingency is $667,414. As I mentioned, this project was expanded in scope. The original um, projection within our current budget was $375,000. Uh, however, we have dollars available in a Butte Street water main replacement project um, that would, would be reallocated towards this project as that project uh, that was originally anticipated is likely either going to go away or be modified in scope. So funds are available. Uh, staff would uh, recommend approving council option number one which would be to approve a contract with Bob's Excavating for the $531,831, plus an additional authorization for contingency not exceeding $80,825. Councilor Dodson. You don't need to loop this? It seems like that's what we've been talking about doing. Well, the, it's on, I guess, on Upham Street. I think it's technically already looped. There's still undersized water mains in the area. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm not that, I can't remember what that looks like up there, but um, this is replacing existing undersized lines. And then, you know, it's still, there's still looping. Yeah, the area yeah I guess it's a pretty short. Yeah. 200 lineal feet that's not Yeah, included. I don't know the specifics. I apologize. Okay. I don't know the specifics towards anything outside of the limits that were right here on how they scoped it. I would move to uh, approve a contract with Bob's Excavating Inc. in an amount not to exceed 531831 and authorize a Additional not to exceed contingency allowance of 80825 Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Um, thank you. 
7.3, authorization contract amendment number 11 with Sladen no, Const um, Constructors Incorporated for phase three in the amount not to exceed $1,658,000. $986 and Waste Manager Chris Claymore reviewing. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here tonight along with uh, representatives from uh, Sladen and Carollo Engineering asking for consent in executing contract amendment number 11 with Sladen Constructors Incorporated. Amendment 11 will cover uh, 3A and 3B phases of design work along with a procurement of a second screw press used in the dewatering process. Uh, phase three has been broken into the two parts, three and, and B, to take advantage of Sladen being on site and eliminate the remobilization costs. Uh, phase 3A construction will include a new aeration basin. This basin will allow the decommissioning of the primary clarifiers that is currently on its last leg as well as allowing staff to move away from the faulty digesters and convert them into um, WAS storage. Uh, phase 3B will include miscellaneous structural work to provide fully functioning facilities in this phase. I am asking for approval of Amendment 11 to Sladen Constructors Inc. contract in the not to exceed amount of $1,658,986. Uh, do you have any questions tonight? Contract for phase three and amount not to exceed one million six hundred fifty eight thousand nine hundred and eighty six dollars. Sorry. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. 7.4 Resolution authorizing the city manager to file an application and execute a grant agreement with the Oregon Water Resource Department for a grant pursuant to the feasibility study grants for a beneficial reuse um, feasibility study. And we have wastewater uh, manager Chris Claymore reviewing. Uh, hello again, Mayor and Council. Uh, this one's a, a little bit better exciting opportunity the city has to apply for a 50-50 matching grant through the Oregon Water Resource Division. This grant will help fund a beneficial reuse study to identify the most cost-effective way to implement the reuse program. Uh, this proposed study will help identify a program that can include artificial groundwater recharge and alternative methods for delivering Class A water directly to end users. Uh, this feasibility study will also generate the information needed to apply for future grants to help implement a beneficial reuse program within the city. At this time, the project costs have not been determined. This resolution will just allow the city to file the application and assure the Oregon Water Resource Division we are committed to matching their contributions. Okay. Do you have any questions for me tonight? No, I just, just think this is good. I think we need some of these questions answered. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, with that, I would move to introduce a resolution and read by title only. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? City Manager, please read the ordinance by title. A resolution authorizing the City Manager to file an application and execute a grant agreement with a Oregon Water Resources Department for a grant pursuant to the feasibility study grants for a beneficial reuse feasibility study. And I would move to approve the resolution. Second. Roll call, please. Councilor Topo? Yes. Councilor Dodson? Yes. Councilor Stuenberg? Yes. Councilor Lane? Yes. Okay, thank you. 7.5. A resolution of support for the request Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development Technical Assistance Grant Fund. We have Planning Manager Joe Wall reviewing. All right. Seems like we have a lot of grant requests this evening. Uh, this is something <laughs> I had brought in front of Council uh, kind of during other matters during the last meeting, but uh, letting you all know that it was my plan to apply towards this grant through the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. I since put in the grant, and part of it is a resolution of support from the local governing body. 
Um, what I put the grant in for was to complete a new economic opportunities analysis. It's basically a study of all employment lands within the urban growth boundary, so commercial, industrial lands. This was last completed in 2008, and it's about a 20-year planning horizon that they look at. Um, there's been some change since 2008. There really hasn't been too many large industrial sites developed, but I do think some additional detail really needs to be looked at our large lot industrial lands. The report in 2008 specifically noted that we have zero acres of large lot shovel ready industrial sites that are basically ready to develop in the near term. And I don't think much has probably changed since then. Mm -hmm. uh, the 2008 report, it didn't go into too much detail into what they call the buildable lands inventory. I'd like to spruce that up a little bit. I think the problem that I found with an existing report is we may have a lot of acreage on paper, and we've discussed some of this. You may have, let's say, 300 acres of industrial zone land that is the South Suburban Sanitary District. But well, you're not putting anything on the shit ponds, we'll just say. It's, mm -hmm. it's probably in a wetland and mm -hmm. eh, whatever. <laughs> so... With that, on paper you have all that acreage, but are you going to develop that? I don't know. I know. I, I don't know how to break it down, but there's also a lot of industrial land similarly immediately next to the river that counts towards our inventory, but for all purposes, I think is industrial in name only. You're just not developing yeah. it. So what I'd like to do, I kind of think this grant is really a first step towards more of a lands readiness assessment. Uh, I think we in Casita have probably needed to do this in more detail for a long time. Um, typically, before you go out, recruit, solicit sites, you should have a very good feeling of what you have there, what the constraints are, how to overcome those constraints, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that's kind of more of a long-term plan with this. Uh, I will note, since the grant was initially completed, we did the housing needs analysis, which we hadn't done before. So we have now studied all land within the urban growth boundary, employment and residential. Um, a small component of this project will be seeing if any of the surplus residential land could be converted to industrial. I don't necessarily think that's applicable, but what that ultimately gets to is, can we look at expanding the UGB for additional industrial lands if we have the shortage that's documented today? Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I have applied for this grant before, and I haven't put in any match because it hasn't been required, but in talking to our DLCD rep, they've kind of strongly encouraged that we have some skin in the game. So in going into the past budget, uh, we put $10,000 in the Economic Development Property Fund for the local match purpose on this DLCD grant. So I've roughly estimated in conversation with some consultants an uh, overall cost of about sixty-five k. Uh, I put in a grant request for fifty-five, dollars and a local budgeted match of $10,000. Okay, any questions, comments? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I wrote this myself. I would move to introduce the resolution read by title only. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, All opposed? City Manager um, Jessica Lindsay, please read the ordinance by title. A resolution of support for requesting Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development Technical Assistant Grant Funding. And I would move to approve the resolution. Second. Roll call, please. Councilor Bethel? Yes. Councilor Dawson? Yes. Councilor Steinberg? Yes. Councilor Lane? Yes. Very good. And I really appreciate what you're doing as planning manager, Joe. This is excellent. Great. Good job. Um, under other matters, Chief of Police, Chief of Police. Teamster Contract. Uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I get, yes, we did. Okay, I thought you did. Yeah. Mayor and Council, okay. we're going to ask you to uh, ratify the, the contract we talked about earlier this evening, to ratify the contract. So 2021 to 2023, Teamsters employment contract will have the same contract. Okay. How do we do this? Just move to ratify the contract? Yes, you'd have yeah, to. it's in there. The contract with City of Falls for the next two years. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? 
Thank you very much. Appreciate all your efforts on that. I and just then, have a comment. In yes, general, go ahead. I like longer contracts, but the police chief of police <laughs> convinced us because of the uh, study, uh, the wage study that's going to be done, that the two years makes the most sense. So I'm on board with it. Very good. Thank you. And Scott Souders, please. Thank you. Turn that on. I have two, uh, I think, quick items. One's definitely quick on for other matters that came up just in the last couple of days. The first one, I just wanted to, this is more just letting you guys know um, what's happening with one of our construction projects, uh, the Lakeport sewer realignment project. If you recall, we approved that back in July for Bob's excavating to realign the sewer line away from ODOT's bridge um, where, where Highway 97 passes over Lakeport. Uh, that project is in order to accommodate some bridge foundation retrofit work that ODOT has coming up. The, the sewer line's roughly 16 feet deep, and when we dug down, we encountered some very sandy soils, and when we encountered those sandy soils, the trenches continued to cave in on us, and we've been working with that on lots of creative solutions with the contractor. Work's progressing, and things are happening fine on it, other than the fact that it's costing us more money. Mm -hmm. So with that project i think this is the first time i've maybe the second uh, since i've been here where we've come up and said hey by the way the contingency amount's not going to cover it with that project we authorized 15 percent contingency allowance of 30 roughly thirty seven thousand dollars we're not thinking we're going to have enough money for that so we're basically just letting you guys know at this point there's no way to quantify it because it's a day-to-day -day basis on how much it's caving in, but <clears throat> a pretty good chance we're going to go over that 37000 And obviously we can't stop the project, come in and get authorization for additional contingency to then go because the road's closed and it's in the middle of the street. So where we're at, we the project should be done by the 28th of October. Once it's done, so anything that's in addition in quantities, we're tracking those on a daily basis. Uh, additional excavation needs, additional quantities for trench backfill, those sorts of things. Um, we're keeping that all daily tallies with the contractor. When we're done, we'll be able to do all the math, and if we exceed that thirty-seven thousand, we'll have to come back and ask for additional funding in order to square up with the contractor. Any questions or thoughts? No, that, just my th that that's going. The, the timelines as long as you guys were expecting it just feels like that road's been closed a while yeah it's closed longer than we wanted for sure okay so yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. slowing us down too. yeah it's slowing us down okay. um I don't, I don't know if anyone's been getting feedback on but it's I'm like i can't believe this project's still going on up there yeah I mean, the road's but closed. it's like i said it's a sewer line that's 16 feet in the ground yeah and we tried to just do this with a standard trench patch and and with the trench so they dig the hole and then they have to put safety trench boxes in there there's a void between those trench boxes and the and the dirt, you know. It's basic, those trench boxes are there to protect the workers in, ca in case it does cave in. But that void, every time the, sem the trucks go over the road above, it's shaking the ground down there. And it's, mm. for some reason, it's sandy soils. And we don't find this very often in the basin. But those sandy soils then collapse in up against that trench wall. And then they're having to, when they move the trenching, they have to go in there and dig it back out and then that's additional rock they have to put in and plus we're losing more of the street so we're going to end up having to patch more of the road as a result of it undermining underneath the asphalt so so yeah long answer but that's what's happening we want to make sure you guys are aware of it the 28th if we had to keep the road open we would be looking at a much longer time period than that because mm. obviously we don't want cars driving around driving by there when it's that deep yeah. so and and they still have services right now, the customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no services no are being disrupted. No, okay. the existing main line still running, and then they'll when they have to do the switch over, they bypass pump it, and okay. there hasn't been any service complications. Okay. To this Anybody point, else questions? We're good. Okay, the second one, and this is one Jessica has been involved with as well. Um, we were going to send this to you in an email, but I, I want to just have some discussion. It's It has to do with Link River Estates. So Klamath Greenways Foundation, and so Klamath, Link River Estates is, I think, are you all familiar with where that area is? It's the subdivision that was constructed, I think, in 2006, and it's been sitting up there ever since there. I think the land went into bankruptcy, and a, and a bank or a lending institute over in the Grants Pass area um, is in control of the property at this point. 
we've been starting to get some inquiries on the lots um, residential individual onesie twosies people wanting to come in and are interested in in building up there <clears throat> currently the site has all utilities to it um, there's a pump station up there that I don't think is active as we sit here tonight but I think it's minimal effort we have to hook some SCADA systems up to it and we we would get that fired up if anybody were to go up there and pull a building permit it's 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 been accepted by the city all the infrastructure is in place <clears throat> Klamath Greenways Foundation is a group that was established in 2007 following this project being developed because the city apparently released some, um, some greenway easements up there of some sort, um, um, site distance easements or something like that. Then, and a group of citizens known as the Greenways Foundation now established in 2007 to essentially protect the balance of Conger Heights. So that portion that the city owns just off the end of Link River States, the city owns the rest of that hillside. And the Greenways Foundation was established as just concerned citizens just to not allow something like Link River States to happen up on the canyon. Currently there's five board members and as I know it, there's five active members. There may be others, but I'm only aware of five folks that have brought this to our attention. They have identified funding through um, Trust for Public Lands to potentially purchase that land, to potentially purchase the subdivision before any of the individual lots are sold. And like I said, we have activity on those somewhat. Nobody's actually come in and pulled a building permit, but, but there has been some inquiries. The Trust for Public Lands is interested in pursuing grant funding that would take them two to three years to obtain in order to purchase that land for somewhere between $1.5 to $2 million in its entirety. Before they'll move forward, they want to know whether or not a public entity will take possession of the land and put it in their inventory and would be willing to put deed restrictions and, and, and what they call scenic easements. That's what I was looking at it for earlier and deed restrictions that would basically protect the interest of that land and not allow it to be developed for commercial residential development into the future. The trust for public lands has indicated to the Greenway foundation, the Greenway foundation, again, is some local residents that they would be willing to do this if the, a public entity, so Greenways Foundation has come to the city and asked us if we would be interested in taking this property on. Before doing so, obviously if we were to do this, we'd have to go through Parks Advisory Board and we would go down that, that road. But before I spend staff time doing all of that, I wanna know if there's any interest at this level or if we need to have work sessions or if you need more information. But what it would mean is that Jessica's talked to the current property owner or the representative, and they indicated that they would hold the property for two to three years if $7,500 to $10,000 per year were paid to cover the property taxes. And the Greenways Foundation would be looking to us to do that. There was some indication that additional match dollars may be needed from Klamath Greenways Foundation. I would expect if additional match dollars were needed, Greenways Foundation would probably come to the city and ask us for those match dollars. That hasn't been addressed specifically, but it's been mentioned. We had a big meeting on this a couple of weeks ago. Um, some of the things that we brought up were costs. You know, it is ongoing maintenance costs. If we were to do this, there's, there's indication that they would want to continue access up there, maybe on a daily basis with a gated access to be able to, for folks to be able to drive up there. Um, they've asked for potentially a restroom facility and waste receptacles, which increases, has additional costs associated with all of those things. Um, short term would be those sorts of things. Long term, we, we can't forget about the fact that we would be bringing that in, the road maintenance, the weed abatement, restroom and waste um, management servicing, gate management, potentially added staffing, throwing all this stuff out there for you guys to think about. Our, our parks master plan that was finalized in 2019, there is nothing in the parks master plan associated with this specific area. And one thing that the parks master plan specifically did was it stated that the, that the focus for the parks department within the next 
whatever that the window is, 10 to 20 years, I can't remember, um, would be to enhance existing parks facilities over developing new parks facilities. That's in our parks master plan. Um, Link River States is not recognized by the parks master plan. So going back to the reason I'm telling you all this right now, I'm trying to find out whether there's any interest with any of the counselors to pursue this and for staff to spend time further investigating, evaluating this opportunity and to take it to parks advisory board or if we need a work session on it. Um, and, the, and like I said, time is sort of of the essence because they would be willing to hold the property, but some, some earnest money would need to be Councilor placed. Blaine. Yes, um, so I do have some questions. I have been on the board for the local lake land trust that we have here. Okay. So I have some questions and I, I think I would be interested in a work session because I'm wondering why these are the requirements when there are generally, um, if you're trying to acquire this kind of property for a conservation purpose through a, a trust, um, there are other options and other ways to do this. So I'd like to hear more from them. Okay. So the work session in your mind would be from the Greenways Foundation making the presentation to you for what their vision would be. Uh, in particular, why we would need to be involved in it. Okay. They should be able, I feel a little bit that they, if that's their serious goal, that that should be something that they have the capacity and maybe they don't have the capacity to do that, but there are other organizations that per perhaps do. That would be the, are you suggesting that they would be the holders of the land versus the city being the holders of the land? Yes. Okay, good. All right. I didn't know that. That's the reason why I'm doing this with yeah, you guys tonight. Most, most of the land trusts that are involved in these kind of acquisitions hold those land themselves mm -hmm. and have stewardships. Um, so I'm curious why they're approaching us and if there's a particular reason for that. Okay. Good. I would join in that. Uh, request for a study session. Okay. Councilor Johnson. Uh, I don't know if I have enough information. Um, all I ever hear, honestly, people talk about is there's not enough housing. There's a road. There's all city services. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I appreciate everyone repeatedly saying that the link river canyons you know this natural preserve i can see a dam i can see a canal i can see houses at the end of the river i don't know if i agree with that being a natural preserve that being said well and i see power lines running along the, the west side of it every time i'm in there uh that being said when i'm in there it'd be sweet to have a zip line across it <laughs> but that's probably not in their vision of conserving a place either uh, so, I guess speaking through this, like, uh, I'm fine. I feel like it's already developed, right? I, I'm fine if the development changes and if there's 40,000 people that want that to be a city park, come forth and tell us. <laughs> there's uh -huh. five. There's a million and a half dollar road in there. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, the I, I'm willing to listen to a work session, but in general, I'm not supportive of... of of, of that vision, I guess. Okay. Councilor Tofel. I'm always reluctant to take private property and potential property tax revenue and put it in public hands for individuals uh -huh. the public we feel. And uh, I, I think over the years they've had this opportunity a couple times. So it's, a work session would be in order, okay. I believe. So it seems like that's the general consensus right now, but we could schedule a work session and, you know, they're going to be looking into February probably before we'll have time to get to a work session. And, and I, I will make sure that we relay that to them. 
I'm guessing maybe late January, but I know our work session schedule, <laughs> your work schedule, session schedule is very full right now until January, February. And so I don't think that we're going to be able to, I'm hearing that we can't make a decision until at least a work session. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I tend to agree on this one. This one is already developed and ready. Um, and so I just, I'm willing to listen to them, of course, for their ideas. Um, but why they wouldn't be able to purchase that on their own and find the other opportunities to do so, I agree. I don't think the city should be holding property either. Okay. So, okay. So I'm happy to, so what I'm hearing is, I'm happy to help facilitate getting a work session scheduled, but a lot of the tasks that were being asked of us at this point, I, I, I don't see justification in me reassigning staff to spend a considerable amount of effort on these things that I talked about that it would cost us at this point. I'd, I'd rather not do that, and I think I'm hearing you guys say the same thing, but mm -hmm. we'll go ahead and get them on a work session if they're willing to or want to. That's the other thing that bothers <clears throat> me is the potential costs associated with it if it comes into our hands. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Correct. Okay. So we'll run, we'll run, I'll work with Nicole and we'll get a work session scheduled and we'll advise them if they want to come with their own presentation. Okay. Perfect. Be great. Thank you. So any other um, person wanting to bring anything up during, um, Jessica did. oh, Jessica, go ahead. On Memorial Drive? Did on you mem or did you want to do that another time? Um, I think I'll bring it up at the next one because um, Councillor Andres is the one who who replied back mm -hmm. about it, and so I think it'd be better to wait till he's here. Okay. okay, very good. So, anything under other matters for anybody else? Okay, I will um, entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay. All, in, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Adjourned. Thank you.